Hello and welcome to another episode of Ancient War for Answers. This is episode 149. And today we have a question from someone who calls himself Mythic Lore. Yes, and he wants to know Murray, my assistant editor of Ancient Warfare. I am Jasper Ortiz, editor of Ancient Warfare, by the way. Murray, he wants to know, what do we know about tactics and formations of the late Bronze Age? That's a rather specific question. Yes, well, the we can be relatively specific about the answer is not a lot. But, of course, the late Bronze Age is a very, very wide and all-encompassing uh, title. So the reality of the late Bronze Age uh, is you're dealing with the period around about 1200 BC. So you've got, you know, cultures in Egypt and the Near East. Uh, we've also got Greek and uh, other cultures as well. So we're dealing with a lot of material in terms of the evidence that isn't really aimed at telling us the tactics or the formations. So we do indeed get inscriptions or reliefs that show us infantry, cavalry, and chariots. And, uh, you know, in the Assyrian world, we absolutely get siege equipment as well. Uh, whether you can then create formations and tactics from that is is something that uh, tends to involve a lot of extrapolation. You've, of course, got literary sources from a much later age telling you what was happening in an earlier age, uh, specifically Homer in terms of Greek warfare. Uh, but it's very, very hard to then talk about formations and tactics in terms of any kind of definitive idea um, by the end of the the late bronze age whether you accept the idea of a dark age or not um, one of the things of course about the dark ages is that they tend to be called that because at a certain period generally in the 19th century there was a lot of information missing meaning literary information and so as time has evolved and we've started getting more and more archaeological finds all of the dark ages tend to shrink to a very very slim period um so you know the idea once upon a time was at the end of the the trojan war around about 1150 bc uh greece descends into a dark age that they don't emerge from until homer in uh, around about 750 bc so there's you know 400 years of dark age that's now shrunk to a much much smaller period of time and of course it's different in different places because of course we have different information but across all of those the idea of formations and tactics are things that tend not to be concrete but very much dependent upon what the current theory is on how those arms and weapons worked so we tend to have images on archaeological tool, whether it be pottery, whether it be um, metallurgy and other things like that, that show us soldiers of some kind. So we can then say that these, these are spearmen. They've all got armor. They've all got some kind of shield. Uh, again, those shield shapes change. And according to some theorists, the, the function of the soldiers change based on the shield shape. Uh, you have, you know, tower shields and figure of eight shields, as they're called. Uh, you've then sort of evolve into the round shield, which isn't yet the Argive Aspis, which again is another kettle of fish about when did the, the hoplite shield begin um and was it used the same you know a round shield is a round shield and standing next to someone with another round shield very similar to a phalanx but it's not a phalanx yet um and the problem is of course the evolution of the phalanx is a is a movable feast depending on your viewpoint um one of the most radical ideas now is that the 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 phalanx as we know it, the classical greek hoplite phalanx doesn't occur until the fifth century bc so very very late uh whereas earlier ideas would like to think that it evolves in the seventh uh, century bc maybe even in the eighth and so when you're looking at homer is he describing a, a proto phalanx and you know he uses the word um so it's very tricky uh but again you have masses of infantry doing things um you've got the idea of course uh in the egyptian army that there are divisions of troops whether they be infantry divisions or, or chariot divisions or whether they be mix a mix of all, all all sort of troop types combined arms and they say with combined arms it's a very 
modern phrase about this idea. You know, the, the ancients didn't have theories of combined arms, but we like to think that they did by seeing that they combined infantry, light infantry, and cavalry together, and we will identify that as, as combined arms because that's a very modern, buzzwordy kind of way of describing it, whereas that was just the division, perhaps, for, uh, you know, just like the legion. Uh, the Roman legions had cavalry attached to them. That was just the legion. So uh, there's those sorts of issues as well. People like to think in terms of formations. They like to think in terms of, of, of tactics rather than just some massive men charging around a battlefield without any real plan. Uh, and yet at the same time, when you read sections of the Iliad, that's exactly what's happening. Most of the time, uh, there really isn't a plan. And of course, one of the problems with the Iliad is that because it focuses on heroic warfare, so you have individual heroes who are doing great deeds, there are all these nameless, faceless minions who are around them also fighting, but they aren't the focus of, of literary accounts. And even in a later age, and, you know, even even uh, the Battle of Kadesh, for instance, we get the account of what Ramses is doing, not what the hordes of his army are up to necessarily. So there's a real interesting idea that even in the, the framing of warfare, uh, not just in, in Greek terms, but in terms of the... Um, even in terms of the Egyptian and the, the the Near Eastern effects, they're concentrating on what the commander or the king is up to, and that's the focus. And even though it's his generals and his soldiers who are achieving this, you know, the king is doing these things. So in many ways, the idea of, of formations and tactics aren't something that they're emphasizing. Now, you can find um, books today that will talk about the breakdown, precise, minutiae breakdown of what, you know, tens and fifties and hundreds and thousands. Uh, and that really doesn't help us in terms of how did they go about doing it on the battlefield. Um, and in a way, we've sort of gotten locked into this idea that somehow knowing the depth of a line and the width of a line tells us what that unit does, uh, when I think it's a far more nebulous kind of, well, they're doing multiple functions generally i mean you know for instance you look at a lot of the the persian armies uh and and even the near eastern armies they're all armed with swords and bows and occasionally with armed with spears bows and swords so they can be spearmen bowmen and swordsmen uh rather than it being spearmen swordsmen and bowmen uh they can actually be quite flexible in terms of what they're up to. Um, you know, with, with chariot forces, you've got chariot runners uh, as well. So it seems that there are, there's some kind of attendant who accompanies chariot forces. What are they? Are they replacement drivers? Are they light armed troops? Are they, you know, do they have some other kind of function or do they do all those things as required? And, and none of these sources really tell us these things. And occasionally we get very, uh, you know, tantalizing suggestions that maybe these uh, individuals are performing multiple roles or that they are just some chosen individual. Like, for instance, the charioteers in the, in the Iliad, we have, you know, named charioteers on several occasions who are the driver for their hero. And yet on other occasions, it's the heroes who do the driving themselves and there's no charioteer anywhere near. So, what happened to the charioteer? Did he dismount and go and do something else? Um, and, or did he form a, you know, a, a, a formation? We don't know. Um, but we do know that on some occasions we get named charioteers who are waiting for their hero to mount the chariot and they drive them where they need to be. And in others, there are just empty chariots lying littered around the Homeric battlefield, which seems very strange. Um, and that, of course, raises all sorts of issues with the descriptions of warfare that we have, you know, we, we have chariot tactics, for instance, we know that the Hittite chariots seem to have three men in them um, and were heavier than the light two, uh, two man Egyptian chariots. And that there's a theory that of course the Hittite chariots could, could cut through uh, Egyptian chariots, which they do at the battle of Kadesh and other theories that the Hittite chariots would then dismount and fight as infantry, as opposed to a mobile archery platform. So again, even with chariot tactics, there seem to be 
flexibility in different uh, tactics. I mean, Babylonian chariots seem to have four or more men in them. Uh, and so there's, a, there's, again, there's different theories of, of how chariot tactics work. So in that regard, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and some of the books you would read would try and tell you that there's not a lot of uncertainty. But I think there's a lot more going on in the literary sources and even in the interpretation of the of the physical remains that can suggest tactics and formations but at the same time that's not the way that the the minds of the time thought about warfare they thought about warfare in an entirely different heroic great leader great commander achieving great things kind of way this is again an example where are you know friendly 19th century Prussians who did so much of that early early research sort of yeah. primed us for a certain way of thinking. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, you know, and and we're here we are, you know, 200 years later, still trying to undo that way of thinking. Um, and in many in many cases, when we're, we're not able to break down how to think about warfare without thinking about it through a 19th century filter. Thank you. 